Right, right. Well, the word good, very often when we tell somebody something's good, this is good, whatever, uh, I'm good. Uh, I know, uh, you know, my grandson, he uses that phrase a lot. Oh, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, well, what do we mean by that? And, and how do we use it? And is it a biblical thing? Well, what I'm trying to do uh, these weeks leading up to our Christmas holidays is last week, was on gratitude. These are Christmas graces. They're graces for the whole year, but primarily at Christmas time, we think of these things. And one is gratitude. Today is on good. Next Sunday will be on generosity, and then the following Sunday on love, and then the 18th, our Christmas time. And and so uh, we want you to do that. And the 11th also, Lance will tell you more about that, but uh, uh, that'll be our uh, Christmas meal, and we're looking forward to celebrating that together as a congregation. And so there's a lot of good things that are happening. There's a lot of good things happening in our world. Uh, There's actually some good things that happen on the news every now and then. But what does that word good mean? Well, in the Bible, it is the Hebrew word tov. Now, there are very few books about goodness. And I don't know why. I haven't written one either, and uh, none of the other guys. But uh, uh, one fellow has, and I've been reading his, and it's more about social justice issues. But, but there was one chapter in there where I could glean some things. And I found out that the word good is used over 700 times in the Bible. Think of that. Over 700 times. It's good. Goodness is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in one's life. And the Holy Spirit manifests himself in us and through us. And the fruit of that is goodness. Just flat being good. Look at the text. Let me read the wider part of it. Uh, Moses is interceding for the Israelites. In verse 12, then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, and Moses is talking to God. I pray you, if I found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. Moses had spent enough time with Israel and their rebellion and their complaining to understand at this point in his life. He was saying, God, the, you know, not my, these are your folk. And that's sort of the attitude in this prayer that Moses is praying. And uh, the Lord said, my presence shall go with you and I will give you rest. What a promise. And he said to him, if your presence does not go with me, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, Is it not by your going with us so that we and I, your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? Now, I want to pause there and I want to say something to us. These are the people of God, just like today we are the people of God. You don't have to be Israel for this promise to be fulfilled in us and through us as Calvary Baptist Church. The distinguishing factor of a believer is the presence of God. Isn't that wonderful? Not only that we can know and feel in our own heart, but that others can see that there's something of God about this person. So listen. Verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Did you know that God knows you by name? Whatever your name is, God knows it. He knows you by name. I love, isn't there a song about that? He knows my name or something like that? I think so. I love that because it's a reminder even in song that God knows my name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. Now, if you mark in your Bible and you underline or you highlight uh, and you have your Bible open, I would encourage you on verse 18 to underline the word glory. I pray you show me your glory. And he said to him, 
I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. I would underline goodness. I've highlighted it in mine. But I would at least underline it. And will proclaim to you the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory, underline glory, while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. I want you to notice something in that passage that I noticed this week, and I just, it just, I I had one of those moments inside, one of those aha moments, wow, I don't think I'd ever seen that, but in verse 18, Moses says, show me your glory, in verse 19, God said, I will make all my goodness pass by you, and then in Verse 22, while my glory is passing by. Do you see how God uses the word good and goodness, and he uses the word glory almost synonymously to say, Moses, this is what you're going to see. And so when you look at this passage of Scripture, you understand that the executive virtue that governs all other virtues is God's goodness. God is good. Remember that little prayer you were taught, some of you? God is good, and we thank Him for our food. I had a theology professor who quote that, God is good, and we thank Him for our food. You want to make sure it rhymed. But the executive virtue that governs all other virtues is God's goodness. God is good, and God does good. And so the first thing I want us to take away today is the fact that God is good. God alone is good. Now, how how do you relate this with passages in Isaiah and passages in Revelation where it clearly says there is none good, no one does good, no, not one. And then you have a rich young ruler uh, coming to uh, Jesus one day, and he wanted to know what he might do that he might inherit eternal life. And at the end of that conversation, this young guy looks at Jesus, and at the beginning of it, rather, he said, good master. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. God alone is good. So how how do we balance this out between goodness as an executive virtue and a virtue in our life and the fact that none of us do good? The Bible is talking about two different things. And part of what Scripture is talking about is that when we do no good, when we are not good in ourselves, he's talking about our doing goodness for the sake of earning favor from God. And in that aspect, not one of us are good, not one of us can work our way to heaven, not one of us is righteous in and of ourselves. But what the word tov is doing, what the word good is doing, and how God is using that here is to show us that although we can't be good enough to work our way to heaven, when we come to faith in Christ, the goodness that comes into our life because Jesus comes to live in us, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, the outflow of that in our life is goodness. Bitter and sweet doesn't come out of the same fountain. Now, what's the point of that? The point is simply this. We have to be careful what we program in. Because if we put it in, it will eventually come out. It could be pressure. It could be at the end of a playlist. It could be something else. And God alone is good. And in His revelation of His goodness, it is His goodness in us through the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to live that kind of life because bitter and sweet doesn't come out of the same fountain. We'll see that more and more. 
Here Moses, in relationship with the Lord, is, is questioning. I mean, I would be scared to death. I'm telling you, you're not as many people as the children of Israel, and you're not near as cantankerous as the children of Israel were, and I don't have to provide for you near what Moses was expected to provide for them. I'm scared to death pastoring you without the power of God. I can imagine how Moses felt. And it's not a shot at any human being. That's not a shot at you. Don't take it that way. But, but it is a massive task to be a leader of people. And here Moses is begging God for help. And, and God is saying, I'll show you. Moses wanted to see his glory. And, and, and he had been in the mountain with him at one time in chapter 20 of Exodus. And God says, I'll make my goodness pass before you. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, said, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Our God is glorified when you and I are doing good. You see the connection? It's not doing good to earn But it's doing good because of who lives inside of us and how he motivates us to do that. God alone is good, and we are good by virtue of our relationship with him. Not only that, but God's creativeness is good. Did you know God is a creative God? There, there, there is such creativity we would never imagine, and that's where we get our creativity. In first two chapters of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis 2, all through that there is beauty, there's aesthetics, there's excellence, there's everything that God shows in creation. And every time he created, he took a step back, and the scripture says, and it was good. It was good. It was good. What God does is good. Now, you and I live in a broken world, and there's a lot of stuff that happens that God could have stopped, but he didn't, that we would never say is good. But we're not at the end yet. We don't know what's on the other side. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We don't even know some of the results of some things we did yesterday. The whole story is not told yet. Some of you are going to get to heaven. And you're going to have the shock of your life. Because somebody's going to walk up to you and say, Do you remember meeting me at such and such place and doing such and such good deed. And out of that, I began to explore faith in Christ. And I became a Christian and you never knew it. I'm persuaded that's going to happen to a lot of people. A lot of you in this room. Let your light shine. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And everything that God created in Genesis, he said it's good. Now I've got even better news than that for you. When God created Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, you know what he said about them? And what he says about you? Very good. Very good. God is a God of goodness, and all that he does is good. And so you and I are called to be proactive in doing good. Don't just slide through life. Be intentional. Plan your day. Buy you a journal. You can get them for next to nothing. Cheryl buys these little composition books things for herself. I'll order on Amazon, pay 20 bucks for mine, and I don't write in it near like she does. That little thing she paid less than $2 for. And she'll write in it and use that all the time. It doesn't cost much. 
plan some things you're going to intentionally do that are good works, that are good. Because as we surrender to Christ, God transforms us. We'll see that in just a moment. We're to resist evil. If you trace this word good and look at it through its New Testament early church ramifications, there are several things to look at, and one of them is in some scriptures. I just want to uh, walk you through. First Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Peter is writing to the church, and he said, For such is the will of God that by doing right, that's the New American Standard translation. NIV translates it good. By doing right, by doing good, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Good overcomes evil. If we choose good, evil does not win. In chapter 2. And verse 20, Peter writes, For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right or what is good and suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. In chapter 3, verse 11. Let me start with verse 8. To sum it up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And then he begins to quote an Old Testament passage, and he says, For the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. Passivity is never the will of God. Don't confuse passivity with patience. They're not the same. Patience is waiting on the Lord. Patience is Stopping when God says stop, going when God says go. It's waiting on Him to manifest the next step that we take. But passivity is where we just sort of hang back and let life come to us. And whatever happens, happens. And Doris Day's old song, Que Sera, Sera, becomes our favorite song. And our lives are wasted in futility. Because in the space and time we have... We have opportunity to do good and to demonstrate the character of our God to a watching world. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and His ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against Him who does evil. You see, we're in that cosmic battle between good and evil. And God has redeemed us and transformed us, placed His Spirit within us so that flowing out of us might be the very goodness of God. Isn't that great? What are you going to do proactively this week that is good? Now, I know you don't sit around on Sunday afternoon and plot evil. I understand that. I'm not accusing anybody of doing that. But would you sit around this Sunday afternoon and consider something, someone, some way in your family that you can do good? You can do good deeds. You can intentionally do something. That someone may not be able to do for themselves. Or it may be someone who needs encouragement. It may be someone who's hurting deep. And you can just put your arm around them. If you don't have a notebook, I know you got a piece of paper somewhere. I know you got a roll of toilet paper, so just peel some off and get you a ballpoint pen. Don't use a fountain pen. And just write down 
some things that God brings to your heart. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. What a tremendous passage of Scripture. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. That's predestination. Before the foundation of the earth, God knew that Jesus would come and die on the cross for our sins. And everybody that receives Jesus and trusts Him, it's God's will for all of us that we do good works. Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Paul is writing. And he talks about vengeance. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. That whole context of that passage in verses 14 through 21 concludes in 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Have you ever wanted to take vengeance on somebody? I won't ask you to answer or raise your hand. I think that's a human experience. You do this to me, and I'll fix you. And Paul is saying, no, no, no. No, no. We don't overcome evil by doing evil. We overcome evil by doing good. By doing good. He's writing to Titus. In those pastoral epistles, the more I read them, the more I get out of them. But in chapter 1, verse 8, Paul tells the young preacher Titus, uh, he he said, the overseer must be above reproach, and and this applies to me, uh, as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good. Loving what is good. Sensible, just, devout, and self-controlled, holding fast, the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. Right in the middle of that, loving what is good. Chapter 2, verse 3. Now, ladies, I'm just reading the Scripture, okay? I didn't write it. I'm just reading it. Older women. Likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips nor enslaved to much wine. Now, now you've got to break there. If, you, if you've got a glass in your cupboard somewhere, it says not much wine. So chill on the bottle. Teaching what is good. Ladies, I say this in all sincerity. I could call names across this room. And if I call a bunch of names, I'll forget to call somebody else's name, and so I'll not call any names. But there's some of you ladies sitting in this room that are some of the greatest Christians I've ever known. Some great prayer warriors. And most of us have spent time with children and grandchildren. And if you spent time with children and grandchildren, you know their world is not like our world. It's not. It's different. Dad, when you like something on the family text, don't put a thumbs up. Why? That's one of the shortcut emoticons, and I just, mm, yep, okay. That's what I mean by that. He said, no, no, let me tell you what the younger generation sees that. They sees that not as okay, but that you don't care. It's a passive kind of thing. I said, do they put a dictionary with these emoticons anywhere? See, what I'm telling you is that The generations and the worlds are different. But the truth of God never changes. 
And ladies, I want to tell you, we're going to reach young mothers and young women who need you. Some of these kids that are having babies don't even know how to change the diaper. We've got a world of opportunity out here in front of us, right in this town, up and down these streets. God forbid we miss it. Sit and claiming we're marching to Zion. You have the capacity to be this kind of person teaching what is good so they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so the word of God will not be dishonored. Paul goes on. In verses 13 through 16, he talks about looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Listen, Christ is coming. I'm looking forward to it. It is a blessed hope, but I can't sit in my chair and wait. In the meantime, I'm to be zealous for good deeds, good deeds, goodness. Verses 1 and 2 in chapter 3 remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. Man, even the politicians with which we disagree. That's tough. But that's our life. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to produce in us and through us. In verse 8, he talks about engaging in good deeds. In verse 14, our people also must learn to engage in good deeds. To meet pressing needs so they'll not be unfruitful. Do you realize in verses 7 through chapter 3, in this little short book of Titus, five times God talks about good deeds, doing good. It's the virtue of goodness. That only God is good. And when we come to Christ, His goodness is imparted to us through the Holy Spirit that we might live a life of goodness. How do we do that? Hardest thing you've ever done in your life. Moses had to do it. When he first met the Lord in Exodus chapter 3, he saw him in a bush that was aflame but not consumed. Moses on the backside of that desert who had lived for 40 years in Pharaoh's house. Realized his heritage as an Israeli, as a Jew. Saw a guy attacking a fellow Jew and he killed him. Moses had to run for his life because he was found out. And on the backside of that desert, with a bunch of old stinky sheep and rock and sand and a few bushes they call trees and mountains, all of a sudden one of those bushes was in flame, but it was not consumed. As Moses said, I'm going to step aside and see what this is. When he got close to the bush, a voice came out, Moses, take your shoes off. For you're standing on holy ground. In Korea today, the pastors preach and the people worship with their shoes off. Do you know why? Because of this passage in Exodus and being in the presence of the Lord in worship. In an act 
of surrender of our rights to the Lord. We take our shoes off. We stand before him barefoot. That's how you yield. You don't have to do this. For some of you, it'd be really hard to do. That's okay. You didn't come expecting that. I did, so I wore slip ons. But all of you that will, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask you to just take your shoes off. In an act of surrender to God. Lord, I give up my rights to what I want and to myself. And I want your goodness to flow through me and use me. And as a sign of that, I'm taking my shoes off. I'm surrendering my rights to you. I'm standing on the holy ground in your presence. And would you bow your head with me? And would you simply ask the Lord to show you anything in your life that you need to get rid of, that you need to confess? And would you ask Him to show you Something you can do to manifest His goodness this week in your family, in your neighborhood, wherever you are in the traffic patterns of life. And would you take a moment to just pray and to ask Him?